I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host. I'm your host and chief cat herder for the next hour, and I'll be your guide to our conversation as we proceed. If you don't know Audrey Waters, you absolutely should. She is one of the smartest, most influential, thoughtful, and critical writers about technology and education in the world. Uh, she is an astonishing discussant, a fantastic writer, and a really, really perceptive researcher. And we're here to welcome her back because she has a new book out from MIT Press called Teaching Machines, uh, which is a powerful, powerful book that looks at the history of how we tried to personalize learning through mechanisms going back a century. It's a groundbreaking book. It's incredibly engaging. It's impossible to stop reading. Extensively researched with fantastic primary source material that she's dug up. Uh, for anyone working or thinking anywhere around education and technology, I think this book is mandatory. Now, we're also just grateful to bring uh, Audrey back because, among other things, way back in time, way back in the past, in February of 2016, she was the very first guest on the Future Trends Forum. And so I just wanted to honor her for that, and I wanted to quell because she's amazing. Now, with that, let me bring her up on stage. Welcome back, Audrey. Letting me back on the show. <laughs> Believe me, it's my pleasure. It's so good to see you. Uh, and this book is so, so amazing. And you have a bunch of fans already in the chat, uh, people waving at you and clapping. I mean, a lot of really good, really good vibes. Um, you're coming to us from Oakland, California, where apparently it, the temperature at least is paradisial. It's very nice. It's quite lovely here. And uh, no fires in our general immediate proximity, so we can still breathe. Good. Well, it's, it's July. You've got time for that. We have time. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I have so many questions to ask um, about this book. But as always, our tradition in the forum is to ask people to introduce themselves by describing their future, what they're going to be working on for the next year. So now that you have this book under, under your belt in print coming out into the world, what's next for you for the next year? What are the big ideas or what are the big projects that are up and up and coming up for you? Wow, that's actually probably the most challenging question that you could ask me. Um, I was worried, you know, you're worried when you write a book and then it, you, you write it and then you send it off to the editor and it becomes part of like the publishing machinery. You don't actually like think about the book again for a while and then you get the proofs back and then it, send, it goes away. And I'm always worried doing these media interviews for the book now that someone's going to ask me a question of something that I've forgotten that it's been so long since I wrote it that someone's going to ask, ask me a detail and I'm going to be like, is that in the book? Um, so I was worried about getting that kind of question, but actually asking me about the future is really, is quite tough for me right now. Um, as probably many of you know, um, well, as many of us experience, the, the pandemic was just not great. Um, I experienced uh, a profound personal tragedy and I don't really know what I'm doing with my life. I turn 50 in a couple of weeks and I guess I'm having, um, I don't know if it's midlife crisis. It feels like a midlife renewal, um, well, but I don't actually, I don't actually know. I'm just going to kind of sit with myself and uh, focus on, focus on myself and not, <laughs> not on ed tech, which I think will make for a healthier and happier Audrey. So I don't have a good answer because I don't know. We caught you at quite a time. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> um, I, 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 I am all in favor of a healthier and happier Audrey. Um, that really matters a lot. I uh, think probably a lot of people are because it cuts them some slack, right? Like, so <laughs> few people know that like things can happen in the world of ed tech, right? Like Coursera can go public, and I have nothing to right. say. Bill Gates can be accused of like being a you know sexual harassment and weird, creepy stuff with during his divorce and. I don't have to weigh in, so yeah, get it all out in the air while I'm taking a while I'm taking a break, folks. Do your do your edX to you mergers now, because I I don't care. Maybe I mean I care, but not enough to write something. We'll see what happens. Uh, John in the chat says it's hard to imagine ed tech conversations without your important voice, um, and I agree. And <laughs> I'm I'm glad that we can at least uh, hear your voice for this hour. 
Me too. And and I'm I mean I'm you know I love I I love what I do, but I just I need to take a break. Understood. Understood. Uh, friends, we have a wonderful book uh, here, and we have a wonderful person who wrote it. And if you're new to the forum, the way this usually works is I ask a couple of unbelievably easy questions, mm -hmm. uh, and then our guest gets to cut loose. But then my job here is not to be the interviewer. My job is for you all to be the interviewer. I'm here to help you ask questions uh, to our guest. Um, and so, again, you can use that chat box, but best of all, you can use the raised hand to join us on stage, or you can type in the Q&A box, um, and I'd be delighted, delighted uh, to, uh, to move these here. Um, one question I have for you, based on your book, uh, on page 47, paragraph <laughs> 3, line... <laughs> no, I totally understand. I totally understand. I've, I've had questions like that to me, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that struck me is uh, I know you've been very positive about Seymour Papert, um, who, uh, after all, this, uh, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a big fan of constructivism in digital learning, offering a very different paradigm to, uh, say, for example, um, uh, behavioralism. Uh, he also helped design the logo programming language so that uh, students, kids, would be able to uh, control um, machines. As he put it, it would be, instead of having computers programming students, it would be students programming computers. Um, but, but at the end, you, you say this still locks us into a kind of computational thinking uh, framework that even when we try and get out of the B.F. Skinner heritage, we're still stuck with uh, all the limitations and affordances of computational thinking. Where, where do you see people getting away from that and still, and still teaching? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is really... The, the challenge with some of the stories that we've told ourselves about teaching machines um, in general. Um, and, you know, I think that we, we tell a story as though new technologies come along and they replace the old technologies and we're kind of done with that and we've moved on to something better, right? That's the narrative that we like to tell about technology. It's, it's, a, it's a narrative about progress. And I think as Americans, and I should little side note, this book is very much um, a history of education and ed tech in the US. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as Americans, we are deeply committed to the story of, of progress. And I think that we, we believe that, you know, computers are somehow at the, at the pinnacle of this and that um, by, by working with computers, we've sort of broken free or we're able to break free or potentially we can break free from from the past and what i wanted to tell was a story that showed that really a lot of these ideas that we work with are very much embedded in things that came before that are deeply wedded to ideas that predate the computer and predate the computer by a number of decades and that we've carried that with us and i think that the same thing we tell the same stories i think in other disciplines in other fields as well and I think of that as like the way in which you read through the history of disciplines in a textbook. Um, the kind of thing, ideas are laid out one at a time and sort of we move from, you know, we've moved from, from one idea to another and somehow the new idea just displaces the old one. So in psychology, in, in psychology, you know, we had Freud and Jung, for example, and then behaviorism and behaviorism kind of supplanted that. And then we had you know, cognitive science came along and cognitive science displaced behaviorism. And again, I don't think I don't think it works quite that neatly. And I think that, you know, back to your question about Papert, I think that Papert was very much emerged, immersed in a world that was trying to show that we were going to break free from some of these pre-existing ideas, but that were still very much um, enmeshed in the ideas of their time. Enmeshed, I think, in behaviorism, enmeshed in, um, although things were, um, I think new language was used to talk about things, I think that they were still very much enmeshed in what I think is a very 20th century view about mm. man plus machine together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, when we think about that, I think that it, it does in some ways circumscribe, um, it does circumscribe what we do. I mean, we, we think about We've, we, we use all of this language to talk about teaching and learning that we've actually, 
is actually quite mechanistic, mechanistic language. Um, and I think that that's the, it's almost like the play on words with teaching machines. Um, you know, that, that we have, that there's this field in AI called machine learning. Um, and, but also there's this sense that, so people, you know, people who work in AI are teaching machines, um, teaching machines. Um, and I think that we, we kind of confuse a lot of the ideas, a lot of the, the we use language that is, again, um, that, that describes the way in which computers or machinery, we, um, we describe how they operate in ways that I think make us more machine-like. Um, well, that rather than, rather than sort of fulfilling a human potential, they actually sort of circumscribe us. So we think about memory now as being a computer. Um, we think about learning as being computer. And um, we think about the mind as a computer, and it's not. Um, it, it's not at all. I think that our our minds are much more complex um, than just the kinds of things that machinery can do that emulates the behavior, the behavior of of a human. Can't escape the behavior word, can we? We can't. <laughs> Uh, that's a fantastic essay. Remind me, I need to just somehow figure out a way to uh, transport you to my classes this fall. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, Kisa Johnson in the chat um, uh, says this reminds her of uh, what she calls imitation culture. Uh, she says that this is when uh, emulation of bodies of knowledge that weren't studied properly. Uh, an example is famous Greek philosophers learning from African knowledge, uh, for example. Um, this is... Uh, uh, and, and friends, uh, I'm going to have a couple more quick questions, um, but this is your time uh, to ask your own questions. Uh, and again, uh, please feel free uh, to uh, bring in whichever uh, topic or point you have based on where you are thinking and also where you're working uh, and what you hope to accomplish, especially as this next year looks like it's crazier and crazier, depending on how different things fall out. Um, you, you remind me um, of... Uh, in a discussion of the power of the computational metaphor of how 18th century thinking was so based on clocks and clockwork and, and machines and mechanisms. And it's, it's interesting to see that kind of heritage appear in, in the early parts of your book when we look at um, some of the early forms of the machinery and how we are still uh, so, so stuck with those. But one of the big differences now is that we live in the age of big data and data analytics at scale. And uh, in your conclusion, you're very moving in your connection of teaching machines to Shoshana Zuboff, saying that this is one of the great dangers of our time. Uh, all, the, all the dangers that we know well, uh, thanks in part to your work, um, with the connection of big data and education. Where do, you, where do you see this headed for the next year? Are, are we in a battle in higher education where some want to obtain more and more data and, and press it more and more to get more and more actionable intelligence and versus people who think this is an Orwellian dystopian nightmare and, and want to stop it. I mean, has that, does that become even more a zone of struggle about this? Yeah. You know, the, one of the things I would say is that I would think, I would say that actually education has been trapped in a big data nightmare for over a century. The data wasn't yeah. as, but this is something that I think I, I try to show in the book that this, this fantasy that we have of if we can just gather more data about students, right? If we can just gather as much data as possible about students, then we can personalize education to them and make things more make it make it more efficient. Um, this is something that people were thinking about in the early 20th century. This is, of course, connected to the rise of standardized testing, um, which is really um, so deeply intertwined with the history of education technology. Um, you know, we, as we were developing teaching machines in the early 1920s, we were, of course, also developing testing machines. And Ben Wood, who is one of the characters um, in my book, um, he's someone, interestingly, that isn't talked a lot about in ed tech circles, but he's very important in testing, in the history of test, educational testing. Um, he was one of the... Uh, he, he went on to form um, a a ACE, um, he for, uh, helped found um, ETS, Educational Testing Service. Wow. He worked at Columbia University and he was one of the first people to, um, well, he actually convinced Thomas Watson 
to um, donate a computational machine to Columbia in order for him to crunch the data on standardized tests. Um, and it was really his vision. Um, and he was very clear that what we had to do was to mechanize education. And what he meant was we need to, again, get as much data as we can through testing. Um, and then educators would know their students better and be able to individualize education for them. And he meant, you know, standardized testing through achievement tests, aptitude tests, intelligence tests, personality tests. And this was really, you know, part of the part of the interest that he had. And then by extension, quickly, part of the interest that IBM had in both creating products that they could sell to schools, but also creating products in a system that corporations could use, again, to personal to better identify people who would be good IBM employees. So I would say that the big data, this, this big data thing has been something that's really consumed um, education and ed tech throughout its whole history. What we, we have ostensibly, I mean, I would say ostensibly, we have so much more data now. I'm not sure that we have any more useful data than Ben Wood did, right? I'm not sure that we, I mean, we gather a ton of data. We claim to be able to sort of identify more precisely what students are thinking and what students are doing. But I don't know that we actually have better insights than they did in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, yeah. and, I, and I think that that's, that's something that we have to wrestle with is that we've, we, we have been pursuing this sort of policy of mechanized education, right? Automation of education, testing for a very long time. And to what end, right? We, have, we certainly haven't humanized the university We've built, we've built a machine. We've built a machine that doesn't seem to really be interested in a practice of, a practice of freedom. The opposite of freedom. Um, yeah. You have a which, lot of course, Skinner, which of course Skinner was like right on. <laughs> we have to get beyond that. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a, a, a few folks who have, uh, who'd like to join us on stage and a few questions. And I'd like to begin then with uh, uh, David Hull at National University. And let's see if he can join us. Hello, David. Good morning, Audrey. Hello. And, uh, good afternoon, Brian, and uh, to the swarm. <laughs> um, uh, I, Audrey, I just had a um, wanted to piggyback a little bit on on your last comment and and um, uh, last uh, thoughts there. Um, about uh, personalized education. I come from an institution that recently had a um, uh, an initiative called uh, Precision Education with uh, a lot of uh, labeled Precision Education with a massive amount of data collection uh, to in the attempt to personalize learning. And um, from the faculty side, um, we never really found an answer to what precision learning actually is. Um, so number one, I feel like it was a bit of a, a catchphrase or something that seemed to be the uh, ed tech thing of the moment. And my question really is, what are your thoughts on how faculty can kind of uh, become more empowered to become a, a stronger voice in that, uh, getting away from the mechanization, as you said. And uh, I'd like to love to hear your critique on um, the mechanization, but also how faculty can support that in a creative way. Uh, so the creativity of uh, how faculty can um, can reinvent this uh, and be a part of this with with ed tech. So uh, I, I hope that's clear. But uh, just uh, just curious. That's a great question, and I think that like so much of this, you know, this is that's a labor to me. That's a labor question. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's also a kind of labor, I would say, right, to make the university more human, more humane, um, requires the kind of labor, affective labor, that has so often historically been denigrated by the university, right? The university, um, the university is not interested in that kind of work. And so there's a reason then that the university looks like this monstrous um, mechanized uh, machinery is that the kinds of things, care, 
right? The, the practice of care, the ethics of care is not, is not prioritized um, financially or philosophically or, or any of it. And so, it's, so to me, the answer is, of course, for faculty to care, and and that I don't I mean that sound, that can sound quite cliche, but then that also raises so many questions about um, about labor, about who cares already, yes. who does the work of caring already, and what does that mean again if the university system is not set up to honor, recognize, pay for people to care, and we can see this in the other kinds of systems, not not just the faculty, you know, the interaction of of teaching which I think is a deep, which is a deeply caring act, but in the other kinds of services that universities are now wanting to outsource to machinery, right? So rather than having advisors, students can just use the algorithm to tell them what to do, you know, rather than having in you know, people who help students learn how to college, right? Learn how to navigate this giant institution um, that we can have chat bots that, um, and so I think that the university, the university really doesn't want to pay for care, um, and among and and academia, ooh, academia doesn't really do so well on that front either. It's hard to you know, academics, they don't really care for each other, um, let alone people lower on the hierarchy. So I mean, I, it's, it's really hard. Because it's just not it's just not part of the institution. It's not part of the institution's core beliefs and practices. And that sucks. Well, that I certainly agree with you. Um, however, and I'm sorry, I, I don't have a good answer then. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. Um, I, I'd like to I'd like to truly believe that uh, those of what uh, those of us uh, here today, uh, those faculty members here, uh, ed tech community, this is a this is a group of caring. Uh, caring individual starts with Brian, um, and from here, I think this is a great source of those who care, and for those who want to rise up and and start a march of caring. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of uh, what I what I hear hear you saying. Um, there are many faculty members whom I I come across who, who care very deeply, but I also agree that many institutions um, here in San Diego, uh, but also across the nation. Um, are, are uh, filled with with those who are, you know, moving along and may not have that that element of caring. So, and it's hard to. I mean, that's the, that's the other piece of it. It's really like, I mean, I you know, to tell a to tell an adjunct faculty member, for example, you should care more about your students is ludicrous. The university should you know should <laughs> hire people, pay full time you know, gener with full-time benefit, you know, full-time pay with generous benefits. Um, asking marginalized members of the community to care more, that just leaves a bitter, that leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. Um, so, I mean, I think that this is really, it's really part of the systemic ill of, of the university. And I think that, um, to tie it back to the book, you know, I think that this is something that, uh, that as the machinery of the, as the machinery of education really took hold, in the 1960s that people recognized. And I think that what I'd like to see, you know, is, is sort of more of that. I'd like to see a resurgence of people really stating loudly that they refuse to be part of this machine. Um, you know, Mario's, Mario's audio, for example, on the hall, on the steps of Sproul Hall saying, you know, that, you know, that we will stop the machine from working at all. You cannot treat us um, you cannot treat us this way. And us there was students in his case, but I think us should be broader, broader than all of that. Yeah. I certainly agree. Thank you so much for, for that. And uh, I think it's, it's just an, so important to, to bring to light uh, labor faculty issues uh, and those, uh, how it's connected uh, to ed tech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And good morning. Uh, if you're if you're new to the forum, by the way, that's an example of the video chat. So if you would like to just, you know, if you want to join us and follow David's footsteps, uh, just press the raised hand button and you can join us up here. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of questions that have come in. And thank you, Audrey, for that uh, very, very passionate answer. That reminds me a bit of the Biden administration's earlier budget proposals this year, which tried to incorporate uh, caring labor uh, under infrastructure. Uh, 
we have a stack of questions which are more interesting than me. And one comes from uh, Mathieu Pleur at the Université Laval. And he asks, oops, excuse me. Well, he asks if I could press the right button. Is the fight against mechanization also the fight against scaling up or growth? I think that they're, they're certainly intertwined today. I mean, I think that this is, you know, this is, um, but they're intertwined again, historically. And I, again, sorry to be like the, the book, the book. Um, but like, I really, the, the, for me, I was really interested in telling a story that wasn't about computers. Um, partially because I wanted to sort of break free of that narrative, that progress narrative that I, that I talked about earlier, where so many books about the history of ed tech, they sort of throw the pre-computer stuff in the first couple of chapters. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of like, da-da, the computer came and, you know, we we're all, we're all saved. Um, but, you know, I, th I think that um, if we look at when in the early 19 or in the early 1900s, when this push, for machines came, it was really coincided with the expansion of public education, um, with the expansion of educational institutions um, and access to education and expectations about, ex about education. And there were scrambles, of course. There were scrambles, of course, to, to, to staff this. There were scrambles to figure out what, what does it look like, um, particularly a period of, of um, mass immigration to the US, what does it look like to teach everybody? Um, how, do we, how do we do that practically? How do we do that philosophically? Um, but then, because we're Americans, God damn it, and we can't all be mass educated, that would be European, um, right? We have, to, we have to recognize how to take care of our individualism. Again, another one of these things that is so core to American ideology. Um, we want to scale up. We want to make sure that everybody has um, access, or everybody, asterisk, um, not everybody. Um, but we want to make sure that, that we can sort of expand um, public education. But we have to make sure that it's, um, it's personalized. And that's sort of this other sort of paradox, I think, about, um, about teaching machines then and now, is that well, how we expand that is we mechanize it, we automate it, Right. And then, interestingly, by automating it, we personalize it. Um, <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but it, I mean, it makes sense to like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Um, in, in that kind of thought. That's, we get to personalization through standardization. And it's the personalization that we give uh, companies, uh, in that case, they get, and they give back to us. Exactly, uh, exactly. We, we had uh, several questions that respond to what you've been saying, and I, I want to make sure that um, uh, we can uh, bring them up at the same time. Um, this is one from uh, Judith Betchner. Um, Judith, I'm probably mangling your last name. My apologies. I'm trying to get it right. I think it's Betcher. Uh, does your book address how machines can be used to support critical thinking skills? Um. Certainly. Th that's, I think, that, you know, I think that all of the developers of... Um, and inventors of machines believed that um, believed that they were making machines to make education better. Um, they none of them sort of had this vision that by mechanizing the process of education we were going to make things worse. Um, that the idea was that we will we will make education better. Students will move more more rapidly. They'll, through through the materials or and students who struggle will be able to move through the material at their own pace right this very common thing that we that we hear about today was absolutely part of you know part of the vision of, of teaching machines skinner talked about this a lot about letting students um, move at their own pace so um yeah i mean i think that that's what counts as critical what counts as critical thinking skills is something that i'd want to poke at it that, I mean, again, you know, when we even today, when you think about the kinds of platforms that offer personalized learning, right, that, that claim that this is what they do, um, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that we've got really advanced much more, much farther than having, again, 
a set of standardized a set of standardized materials that you could move through at your own pace, right? Where no one is suggesting, neither Saul Kahn nor Mark Zuckerberg's vision or Bill Gates' vision or P.F. Skinner's vision, no one suggests that fifth graders should do um, Egyptology, not algebra. Everyone says we're going to do algebra. You just get to move through algebra at your own pace. Um, so this idea of of personalization is still very much grounded on on a lot of ideas about, about standardization. And so critical thinking within that is, um, it, it, you know, I think it depends on what you mean. So no, really my, my book isn't, my book is a, it's a book is a history. Um, it's, it's less about today, although like any good um, book work of nonfiction, it does have an introduction and <laughs> conclusion that kind of gesture to that. But really it's the story, it's the story of ed tech um, it's this. It's the history of personalized learning from the early 1900s through, let's just say, 1970s, early 1970s, when Skinner um, kind of went down in flames, ostensibly, although not really. Darn it. Oh, he's a kind of specter now. Judith, thank you for that uh, great probing question, and and Audrey, what a fantastic answer. Uh, we have uh, more questions that are on the uh, side of uh, economics or operations. And this is one from uh, uh, David, at the University of Denver, uh, who asks, the money follows rankings, the rankings follow research. Who's going to break the chain so that money flows to education and caring? Or how? Great question. I mean, I think that, I think that we... Um... I think that it would just require a huge recommitment, first and foremost, to public education, um, to really recommitting to the kind, to the visions that I think we've had from time to time in certain places. Um, we have in this country, I say we Americans have had a, a, um, a, a great commitment. I mean, I think that in some ways the, you know, the, the idea that we do have a free education from kindergarten through 12th grade, um, shows that we we do have ideas um, of in which we've decided to invest um, in education. I think that certain states um, had, <laughs> I'll put it in past tense, sadly, mm -hmm. had a great commitment to public higher education that was accessible to everybody, that was free and high quality, right? Um, the state of California, for example, what where I live now, um, the governor, you might have heard of him, his name was Ronald Reagan, decided that he wanted to dismantle that um, for, for political reasons. But I think that first and foremost, I think it really does, we really do have to recommit to public education. Um, and I think that rethinking wh what that looks like, that will require us to, I think, evaluate some of the things that are foundational to these institutions. And some of the things that are foundational to these institutions our beliefs and practices and values that we need to that we need to get rid of that we need to dismantle that we need that we need to challenge i mean our institutions are built on white supremacy for example and i think that we will not ever get we will not ever move towards institutions that are grounded in care if we don't address the fact that we have built these institutions at the k through 12 level as well as higher education um, on ideas of hierarchy um, on ideas of difference, on ideas of exclusion. Um, and so I think that I think that we have a lot of work to do to get towards caring. But I think it's it's political work as well as personal work. But um, yeah, I hope that that answers the question. That was a tough question. Uh, David asks good questions. Uh, thank you for that, David. Um, and uh, Audrey, that's uh, that's an equally tough answer, uh, or at least a strong answer, I should say. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, we, we have another question coming in from a longtime uh, friend of the program and uh, also brilliant uh, CEO and commentator, as well as a wonderful teacher, Maria Anderson. Uh, let me bring her up on stage. Hello. Hello. Hi, Audrey. Maria, hello. Long time no talk. All right. I think um, I can't remember which question it was. I was going to ask... Um, Oh, I think I just wanted to make a comment that I think that part of the the, the problems that we're having is um, we're in a chicken and egg cycle between technology and increased class sizes and increased loads and 
decreased full-time jobs and, and things like that, right? So it's kind of a question of, at this point, what's leading what? I think the economic pressures on education are forcing, are, are making it economically viable for some of these technologies to be built, but they're not actually solving the problems of, of increased learning. Um, and then and then the other thing I just wanted to point out, I, I think, Audrey, that you're familiar with the sleeping, eating, bonding model of problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, I propose, I think Chris Deedy put that in a book somewhere. And I, I really think that part of the, the problems we're seeing around ed tech is that technology companies create learning like it's a sleeping problem. Like it's a very simple AB solvable problem. Try, try this, then try this, then try this. Nothing else is going on. There are no other conditions at play, right? But learning is actually an eating problem. Motivation matters. Your support group matters. Your, your you know, everything about your life matters with learning. And I think um, here's where we have to separate learning and assessment. I think assessment, trying to get at what a person knows in, at this sliver in time is probably a sleeping problem. It's probably a well-defined enough problem that we can get better at assessing things. But if we want to get better at students learning things, it's not something that's going to be te simple technology solvable, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, a completely different animal. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that was interesting to me when I was doing the research for this, uh, I spent a lot of time in archives um, going through um, letters uh, that academics uh, wrote one another within uh, education psychologists wrote one another. And, you know, the, you know, seeing, seeing, looking back and sort of seeing some of the same ideas that we have today with people who sort of um, decide that it seems very fixable to them, right? There's the the famous story that Skinner told in it. I think you know it would be a TED talk if if he were alive today. <laughs> in fact, I think it's I think it actually is Sal Khan's TED talk, oh. um, which he noticed. He went into a classroom and he noticed that students, um, some students were able to do their math quickly, some students were struggling, but the teacher moved at the same pace and gathered up the assignments, um, took them home to grade, and the students didn't get them back till the next day. And Skinner thought, aha, I should build a machine. Um, I think that that's, that was either Skinner or Scott Salkon, one or the other. Um, but I think this idea that, that this is, that education is an engineering problem, right? And if we just can t turn the dial the right way, if we can build a machine and sort of fidget with the dials that we're able to sort of fix it is so common it's I mean and it's been common for a very long time and yeah. you know people ask people say like why hasn't education changed for example or we're still you know it's it's education has changed it's changed immensely but the but it hasn't changed in the way in which I think we we expect these sort of um dials to be adjusted and somehow you know, everyone is learning it. Everyone is learning at three times the speed that they were learning um, a couple of a couple of months ago. I mean, it's a vastly it's a vastly complex institution, institution, and hu individual human learning, teaching and learning are incredibly complex processes. And so, this idea that we can just sort of gadget it, um, you know, we can sort of appify it, big data it, whatever sort of verb you want to use. Um, I think it's sort of, again, it's, I think it's really intertwined with the way in which Americans want to, you know, gadgetize things, but it's, it's so much more complicated. Okay. So now I'm dying to ask you a different, a question I hadn't written in the chat and then I'll get off the stage. Somebody else can. So as we look at how the workforce is changing because of machine learning and AI and automation and all of these things, which got accelerated during the pandemic as well, um, we need to be able to on-ramp students into the workforce at a higher level of experience and understanding and analytical ability than we have in the past because all of those entry-level jobs and entry-level skills are being replaced by machines. How do you think, do you think it's possible that we can continue to do a, like a four-year college education that on-ramps students in at a higher level to the workplace than it does now without having a longer education? Can we skip all the low level stuff and get to the high level stuff? I'm just curious what your thoughts are. 
-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that, I think that we have, that's one of the problems we have is we have expectations of, we have different expectations of what we think the function of education is, both at the K through 12 level and at higher education. Um, and I'm not sure if those, those functions always in, and expectations always match. Um, we, you know, are we doing job, are, are, is the function of the university to do job training? Um, that's a different, that's a different function than what historically this institution has, has really been prepared for, unless your job was one of three things, right? Medicine, not even medicine until fairly recently, the clergy and law. Um, really, the university has been about something else. And I, ideally, students come out with, with the ability to do any number of things. But I think that, um, so I, I don't know that the, the, the expectations that it's a job training center match historically what it's been, what it's supposed to do, or even at the K through, even at the K through 12 level. I mean, and, yet, you, and yet when you look at so many courses at the university, they're like fact uh, as well, especially in the STEM fields, right? It's to, like shove as many facts into you as possible in the shortest amount of time, right? And that doesn't really seem like it's preparing you for jobs either, or or for the or for being a citizen, you know, memorizing. Yeah, it. and I, I mean, and I don't know. Biology, freshman biology is not going to help me ten years later when I'm an adult, you know. Yeah, I don't. I mean, and I, it's it's hard. I think that you know the 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 job market the job market also exists out. Like it's this other thing that I'm not sure the university has much control of. I think that some higher education institutions are much more closely aligned with the job market, the community college system, for example, because historically, um, I think it, that has been part of its function, um, often at a very localized level um, with what are, the, what are the demands of whatever the local industries might be, um, and how do we quickly turn out people who have the skills for that. But for four-year institutions, I don't think that that's been necessarily the expectation. Um, other than, uh, and so I don't know, I think that- I think as the cost has gone up, it's become more and more the expectation from the consumer that they're being prepared to get a job. Yeah, and those are the stories, those are the stories I think that the mainstream press likes to tell. They like to shake, they like to shake the finger at the university as though it's somehow the university's fault that the job market is shit, right? I mean, like the university, the university really had, doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter what course, courses you offer, whether they're fact-based biology courses or you know, courses in the, you know, in, in the history of um, Spanish courtly poetry, um, that, that either of those, or, or whether they're, you know, computers, science, computers, programming classes, those don't determine the job market at all. Um, and so that, that, that's, it's a, dis, it's a real disconnect that, that we have. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, we have put a lot of um, faith in this country th that, education is, I mean, it's very aspirational that if you do the education thing, then at the other side of it, you come out and you do, you will get a good job. You will be able to buy a house. You will be able to, whatever the American dream looks like. Um, but I'm not sure that the university is the place that is the deciding factor on that. It's a nice, it's a convenient scapegoat when things go to hell. Um, but it's not really, it's not really, I think the thing that necessarily facilitates that, but boy, we sure have believed that, and we've been willing to go into a lot of debt um, in order to in order to do that part. But I think that the economic story is a, is a lot more complicated, and I think it's unfair to say that it's the fault of universities um, that that things don't work out well. Yeah. Well, I think we could talk about this for another twenty minutes, but I'm gonna yeah, it's another a great twenty topic. hours. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, and, yep. and and keep going, course tune. Thank you. And, and thank you, Audrey, my gosh, that I, I had so many questions and comments myself, and I, but I'm, I'm here for everybody else to do this. Um, to, while I'm bringing up our next, uh, our next question, or one quick note, you remind me of Tressie McMillan Cottom's uh, Gospel of Education yes. uh, from, uh, from her first great book. Uh, our, our next video conversant is Kim DeBacco coming from uh, UCLA. Uh, and Kim, let's see, hello. Hello. Hi, Brian. And hi, Audrey. Really nice Hello. to meet you. Yeah, kind of, sort of, virtually in person. Um, 
I wanted to take a turn back to caring, kind of, um, you know, another take on that. And I was wondering if you could share some thoughts about how we might use or apply the discourse of diversity, equity, inclusion as a critical lens for rethinking technology-enabled teaching and learning. You know, diversity, equity, inclusion is kind of sweeping through, you know, at the moment, um, and everyone's kind of getting woke and working with it and using it in different ways. And um, I just wondered what your thoughts about that were. Gosh, um, you know, I, I, I think that, I think that one of the things when it comes to ed tech, for example, when it, when it comes to ed tech specifically, is I think that we, um, we expect, we expect to, we expect more of machines. I think Sherry Turkle says this than we do. I love our, Sherry Turkle. <laughs> right. And I yeah. think that that's, that that's part of it is that we've decided, we've decided we've, we're going to offload so much of this work onto machines. And, and, and perhaps rightly so, because we have, fa we have failed, I think, to, we have failed to care enough. We have failed to sort of, um, we have failed to reorient our institutions in ways that would be um, more just, that would be more inclusive. Um, but I think that by deciding that we're going to outsource this and allow the machines to do it, we're sort of offloading, we're sort of offloading things um, in ways that will not get us there. You know, I, I think that, um, I, I think that we, we, I think that it's really challenging. Like I said, like I said to, you know, when I responded to David's question, the, the education system, K through 12 and, and higher education, um, it, it seems on one hand, like it would be affective labor, like, or it would care about caring. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons um, that machines were developed, um, and in fact, standardized testing was developed um, in the 1920s, and the processes and practices around around that were that fears about caring, right? So when they developed um, standardized tests and the multiple choice test in particular, which was, could be credited to a number of people, um, but um, Frederick Kelly is often uh, who who gets credited with coming up with it. The concern was that this um, that the that the K through twelve teachers who were women by that stage were going to care too much about their students and therefore not be objective when they assessed their students. So we needed to. So education psychologists decided that we had to devise a way to take the caring out of out. Right. So we needed to come up with a system and the multiple choice test was a, a great way to do this in which the, the teacher didn't have didn't have a subjective um, way, couldn't weigh in subjectively about the student that she <laughs> she could just grade grade a test that was standardized and was objective. And so if you think about the ways in which I mean, I use hard coded as a metaphor, but also literally, the ways in which that has become hard coded into our system, a practice and then a technology that was designed to eliminate caring, right? We've developed now for over a century systems and practices that really have made it so that caring was by design excluded from our practices and processes. And so we have to undo a lot and I think that we have to sort of, then by, by extension, undo a lot of the education technology, right? If education technology is built on the legacy of testing machines, of standardized testing and testing machines, then we're not going to get to a practice of care. And by extension, I don't think we're going to address questions of justice, questions of diversity, um, without undoing yeah. this, these sort of really what are foundational ideas of the field um and i think that that's why for me that's why the history is is so important too i mean these are um you know the the standardized test mm -hmm. is intertwined with eugenics right if this if eugenics and standardized testing are the foundation of ed tech then we're in a lot of trouble <laughs> we're in a lot of trouble if we don't Deep. start to <laughs> think about that and think about that really yeah. quickly if we just yeah. move on 
right? Um, and act as though, well, you know, we don't practice that today. I mean, that's sort of ridiculous. This is the foundation upon which the house was built. The house, the foundation is rotten. The foundation is yeah. rotten. You don't, you, you cannot build a solid structure on something that the foundation is rotten. And the foundation of ed tech is rotten. So what are folks going to do about that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah. What a great question. And, uh, and Audrey, what a powerful answer to leave us with. Um, if, if the foundation is rotten, if it's just shot through with, with all kinds of problems, what should we do moving next? Uh, I mean, should we start from scratch or, or how, how should we proceed? Yeah, I mean, starting from some days, I think, to hell with it, set it on fire, burn it all down, start from scratch. I don't know what else to suggest. But I recognize that um, that, 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 actually, that actually probably leaves the most vulnerable among us more vulnerable. Um, so not necessarily a great thing to do. I do think that there are other other lineages that we can look to, other moments in history, other, other ways of being and thinking that we can look to and build upon. There are other, there are other stories. And one of the things I'm really proud of in the book is, I think, I'll, I'll back up here. I have read a lot of, a lot of histories of education technology, and I don't know how many ever talk about race. It's just not mentioned. Um, school segregation isn't mentioned. None of these ideas are, are really talked about. I, again, I think education technology sort of acts as though it exists um, in this space outside of, outside of politics, outside of the practical um, reality, the lived realities of, of a lot of people. And so in the book, I, I wanted to sort of show what were some of the alternatives at the, in the, in, at the time Right, in this pre-computer era that people turn to in order to resist teaching machines, in order to resist what they saw as the encroachment, the mechanization of education. And that, that to me was, is an interesting thing to, to think about. Where, where else have people found, um, found their ability to resist the machine? And one of the most, I think, powerful examples of this um, were in the freedom schools, um, in particularly during Freedom Summer in Mississippi, um, were you know the idea um, among some of SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was why don't we use teaching machines? Why don't we use programmed instruction? Why don't we use these scientific methods to help, for example? Um, help with adult education, help boost the literacy uh, among um, black, uh, black folks who couldn't vote because they couldn't pass uh, the, the poll tests. Um, but I think the people, they realized very quickly that this was not going to be a practice of freedom, that you couldn't, that that, that wasn't how one would move forward by adopting this technology of standardization, by adopting a programmed instruction that was um, that was written by engineers who had no idea of what the lived experience of a, of a black sharecropper in Mississippi would be. And so the freedom schools were about building, building teaching practices, building education, alternative education, but building educational practices that were community-based, that solved local problems, that were about inquiry, curiosity, self, um, you know, self-fulfillment, but also community politics and thinking about systems that could resist and push back against, even against the educational system, right? Against the kinds of practices that would make education, even, you know, even after Brown v. Board, that would continue to make education separate, you know, separate and, and unequal. And so the freedom schools to me are one of these sites that we can look to historically um, and, and recognize that people have resisted the mechanization of education. They have been resisting the mechanization of education for a very long time. We just uh, haven't heard these stories. We haven't heard these stories because I think the story of ed tech is often told from a very white perspective, um, from a very, uh, and from a perspective that, that sees ed tech as the culmination of education um, and doesn't recognize that there are alternative stories in which resistance 
um, actually can be foregrounded. Uh, Benjamin Whitmore, that may be an answer to your question that you asked before um, about um, students pushing back on, uh, on data mechanization. Audrey, for everybody, that's a fantastic answer. What a wonderful way forward uh, for all of us. And I have to close up on that note because we are past the top of the hour. And you have been so generous with your time, so generous with your thinking. Uh, it's just been an instruction and an inspiration to be able to spend an hour with you. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm, it's, see, it feels very weird. I don't actually have a physical copy of the book yet, so it still kind of feels strange. Um, I, I should get my, my, author, my, my author copies sometime this week, I hear. Okay. But um, I'm very excited for the book to be in people's hands. I, I hope to have more conversations with people um, about this. And so I think, I think that, you know, I think that it's, um, I think it's an important book. Does that sound like weird and egotistical? I think it's an important book. And so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's going to be out there. Writing a book is an act of egotism. It has to be, or you can't this finish it. This is true. <laughs> That's um, true. And uh, I just shared this in the chat. Um, and I'll just share a quick link again, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, uh, to uh, where you can find the book from IT Press, uh, Teaching Machines. Um, and on this note, um, Audrey, please take care. Um, enjoy the uh, conversations that follow. Um, and... Uh, We'll be in touch. Looking forward to seeing you again. Be safe. Uh, if everybody else, don't go yet because we have to uh, let you know what's happening over the next few weeks. Uh, thank you all for your fantastic, fantastic questions. Um, looking ahead, uh, we're going to move to cover a whole range of topics from digital reading to the educated underclass to rethinking teaching. If you'd like to keep talking about all of these issues, so what does it mean if the foundation of ed tech is rotten? What can we learn from freedom schools? What does it mean to teach critical thinking with a teaching machine? Please feel free to keep the conversation going on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. Throw something at our blog there. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to go back into the past and look all the way back to Audrey's first appearance, if you'd like to see our sessions on pedagogies of caring, our sessions on race and equity, please just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. They're all there freely available for you. Uh, in the meantime, thank you again for fantastic questions and thoughts. It's been an absolute treat uh, to work with you. Um, again, everybody, please enjoy summer as best you can. Good luck planning for the fall. Take care. Be safe. And we'll see you online. Bye-bye.